Andrew Yang, hello, welcome, welcome to What Bitcoin Did. How are you? Peter, it's great to be here. The question really is, what didn't Bitcoin do? Am I right? Did everything, man. It's, well, uh, it, it certainly run the gamut from a uh, penny to $62,000 or whatever it is. <laughs> are, are you a hodler? Are you a hodler? You got Bitcoin? Um, so, you know, I can talk about this a little bit. Is I'm a huge cryptocurrency booster. I think most people know that. But mm -hmm. I never wanted anyone to think it was because of my own monetary self-interest. And so I didn't want to be a... Um, holder and investor because then everyone's like, oh, no wonder he's trying to pump his bags. But yeah, and and, and make the regulations more um sensible to the extent there are regulations, which now obviously it, it's pretty limited. Uh so I have not I have been a cryptocurrency investor through uh funds and instruments, mm -hmm. but I haven't uh actually bought any because I wanted to seem clean, clean as a whistle. Yeah, I had a long conversation with a chap named Parker Lewis down in Texas because I was thinking the same of getting rid of my Bitcoin at one point because I said, can I be objective? As a, somebody interviews people and covers the subject by holding Bitcoin, he's like, no, you need to hold it because you are. You would need to hold it. And I'm sure you're fucking glad you have held it, that you I didn't am. do this like, oh, I'm such a principled journalist. I will now relinquish my holdings thank fucking god you didn't do that brother <laughs> well I, no man listen fu i fucked up like everyone does with bitcoin i fucked up so many times i would have so much more money if i'd have got this right but uh listen great to see you great to talk to you i've, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time and somebody got in touch recently and they're like why haven't you talked to andrew yang it's like i'm trying to i want to and here we are there's uh two main things i want to talk to you about well three things i want to talk to you about the, the forward party because as a uh, somebody from the UK, I'm used to a political system with multiple parties. You're used to two. a political system that makes sense? What's that? <laughs> well, makes sense. I mean, makes a bit makes more sense. Makes more sense. More sense. We'll give that that. Still doesn't make sense. And uh, But I'm used to that. Uh, but as somebody who travels and loves this country, I've been here 70 times. I've been to New York 30 times. I really like it. I, I, I could happily live here. Uh, and I feel like most of the problems I see are not caused by the people, it's by the politics and the media. Wow. Yeah, kind of obvious. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, if you just look around, you know, like have conversations like, oh, nice place, nice people, let's do it. And then as soon as you actually stick your nose into what's going on with the politics and the media, like, whoa, yeah. whoa, Don't, what's going on? But I, I do want to talk to you about UBI. Um, I'm not... 100% convinced either way the Bitcoiners don't like it. They, they think in a Bitcoin world it can't work. But, uh, you know, I'm interested to hear about it. I recently interviewed uh, Erika Rhodes, who's uh, running for Congress in California. She's uh, yeah, it's a friend. Yeah, friend of yours, big supporter of uh, the ideas behind UBI. And I also I do want to talk to you about Bitcoin specifically and regulation because, you know what, I always thought the US would ban this. It wouldn't allow this to happen and it's it's happening. We are seeing various politicians, senators, people in Congress who support Bitcoin or even wider crypto. I'm focused on Bitcoin. I'm, I don't care for crypto. But so they're all the things I want to talk to you about. But let's talk to you, start talking about the Ford Party. You've been through a process where you know you tried to become president. Uh, you ran for the presidency. What's that like as an experience to go through? What did you learn most from that? Well, thanks for asking. I write about this a fair amount in my new book, Forward, uh, because I wanted to share my journey yep. with people. Because it's not every day you run for president. And uh, someone described it as an outsider with an insider's point of view. Because mm -hmm. I definitely was a political outsider. just kind of showed up. Um, I remember when I tried to figure out if I could run for president, it turns out there are only two rules. Natural born U.S. citizen and age 35 or older. So if that describes you, you too could run for president. You have to be over 35. Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's an age limit. Why, why, why does that exist? Search me, man. Founding fathers, constitution. But those are the only two rules. And if you think about it, it's kind of interesting what is not on the list. It's not, I'm a public office holder. Yeah. I'm like, you know, like... Uh, Too old. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Now, I, I think a lot of people listening to this probably agree with you, where the U.S. is getting a little bit long in the tooth in terms of its leadership, and they don't understand cryptocurrency for shit as a result. Uh, you know, not to say, if they were younger, it would be better because they at least have peers who'd be like, yo, like, you know, what are you doing? Um, so I ran for president uh, because I was deeply concerned that our economy is transforming in fundamental ways and no one seems to get it in DC. And so mm -hmm. I was like, look, I can advance an understanding of automation and technology's impact. I can advance universal basic income. And 
uh, learned a ton running for president. It was fucking weird, a lot of it. Yeah, I bet. Where in order to compete, you had to become a bit of a performer, a bit of a robot. Um, and I'm an entrepreneur and operator, so the the way I have interacted with the world for the last number of years is, okay, just do whatever the organization needs. Like I ran a company, I ran an education company. It's like, okay, what does the company need me to do? So in this case, running for president, it's okay, what does the organization, i.e. my presidential campaign, need me to do? And it's like, you need to try and get millions of people excited. Uh, and you're like, okay, how the hell do you do that? And so then you spend some time on social media, you you put out different messages. In my case, I think people got to know me um, in different ways and then got excited about me because I was an outsider. They were just mm-hmm. sick of politics as usual. Well, it's the same old people running again with the same messages. Nothing seems to change. And it's all fucking poll tested and the rest of it yep. and consultant vetted where it turns out there's this entire political industrial complex that descends on campaigns and it's like, okay, here's what you say, here's how you say it, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why the candidates seem like automatons. But like the idea of running for president and then actually getting into the process must have been a really fucking surreal experience at times. You must have been in some surreal places where you're like, what the fuck is happening here? The weirdest <laughs> things had to do with the media, where you go yeah. into the spin room after a presidential debate, and holy cow, it's like hundreds of cameras just sticking your face in microphones, and then they just try to grab you like as you're walking around. Uh, and uh, I mean, the spin room, even the name says it all. That was surreal. It was surreal where I'd have a random interaction with a voter and then it would make national news. It's like, what? Like, you know, it's like, who cared about that? Uh, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Uh, the beginning of the campaign, in some ways, was the most enjoyable and most pure because it was just a startup. You know, it was just like a bunch of people, not even a big bunch, like half a dozen people, generally young. I was the oldest person in the room. And we're just being like, all right, we're running for president. What do we do today? What do we do today? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and no one was paying any attention. Uh, so it, it got more surreal throughout 2019 when I started making national debate stages. But before then, it was a startup where you had a goal. The goal was at that time, get 65,000 individual donors and 1% in polling support. So you make that presidential debate stage. Mm-hmm. And then it became 2% and, you know, 100,000 donors. And then it became 3% and 150, you know, it just kept kept on going. Um, but at first it was, let's try and get on that debate stage. And so it, it felt like a familiar startup process for a while. And then it got fucking weird after that. <laughs> well, but you got on the debate stage. You were up there. People liked you. Yeah, that, that was... Uh, probably the most surreal when I got on the presidential debate stage and then went to the spin room and then walked off and then like talked to my family and my wife said it best because I'm married uh, and she said I can't believe I'm married to that guy <laughs> 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 on the TV and then like, I had friends call me and text me and you know uh, um, congratulate me in different ways though, though my first debate was not my best um, and then the second debate and then the third debate, made seven debate stages, uh, ended up on most of all the major talk shows and, and everything else. Uh, and so that, there was like a growth process for me where I, I compared myself to essentially like a media athlete uh, where you have to develop in certain ways when someone just sticks a mic in your face. Did you, um, when you go into this, obviously your goal is to become president, but do you also consider the point you might just be a running mate and that's okay? I'll be honest, I did not expect to be president of the United States. Though okay. when a journalist asked you, you have to say, of course, I'm serious. But what I would say to most of those interviewers was, look, there are multiple ways to win. I wanted to advance a vision. Uh, I believe that poverty is going to make more and more Americans literally crazy until we start killing each other. I think that that's the way it's going to go. And so I, I was trying to prevent that. Mm-hmm. And that was the the mission. I, I'm not sure if people can tell listening to me, but it's not, it's not like I'm some lunatic who was like, I'm going to be president of the United States someday from like age 17. Mm-hmm. I still don't particularly care. Uh, <laughs> I, I, like I, I, I'm an entrepreneur who just wants to solve problems. Uh, and unfortunately, and you and I have shared this, mm-hmm. the problems in the U.S. are getting worse around us. You can tell. Yep. Uh, now, there are segments of American society that are doing just fine, um, but there are a lot that aren't. The politics and media are completely dysfunctional. Yep. And so I saw the scene and was like, okay, the biggest problems require our government to get its act together. It's not going to get its act together. How do I change that? Run for president. Hope to get it. it hope to help it get its act together. I did not win. Fine. Um, but I'm still even now trying to help America get its act together by helping 
advance and evolve its politics along the lines of what you described, which is that if you look at the UK, it has five political parties. Mm -hmm. Germany has seven political parties. These are much more sensible, rational systems than a two-party system, which, by the way, would be a waking nightmare for any of the founding fathers because if you look at the Constitution, there's nothing about any political parties. George Washington was anti-partisan. John Adams said two parties would be an evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, we have, so we have a dysfunctional yeah. system that does not make any sense. Uh, and I think Bitcoiners can relate to this because you look up and think, oh, there are a lot of things that don't make sense. Um, and cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular is a way to try and ha invent a new system that in some ways is much more rational, much more sensible. And so uh, I think the po our politics needs the same thing, and that's what the forward party is trying to make happen. Uh, and the way the forward party is going to try and make it happen is through a process switch to open primaries and ranked choice voting, which would diminish the duopoly very, very significantly and improve our legislators' incentives. So there are 24 states around the country that allow for ballot initiatives like this. One state, Alaska, has already done it. So this is the key lever that we can pull to make our politics more rational. It requires a popular movement. Um, and, and I certainly hope that people in the Bitcoin community like the, feel like this is, is positive, in part because if our politics advance, then maybe our legislators would not destroy the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency communities uh, in the way that, unfortunately, right now, we all know is a possibility. Well, one thing that's come up in quite a few conversations I have within the Bitcoin community is that there is this broad support for Bitcoin, uh, certainly amongst Republicans, um, Senator Lummis in Wyoming, and even Ted Cruz now in, in Texas. Um, it would, we would hate for Bitcoin to become a partisan issue because Bitcoin is a you know, it's a tool, it's a, you know, financial sovereignty. We would hate for it to become something that's just seen as like a Republican issue because then it becomes demonized and, you know, for, for all the wrong reasons. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to understand U.S. politics like you. I'm, I'm merely an observer. I come to the U.S., I love it here. And, and this trip, I've been to New Hampshire, New York, Florida, uh, Texas, uh, Los Angeles. Um, I've been to Cincinnati, Kentucky. I've been everywhere. And everywhere I go, it doesn't matter if it's red, or blue, I have a great time. Everyone's nice. Everyone's decent. It's true, man. I've had the same experience. Yeah. People you, are good people here. But you you put on the news and and whether it's Fox or MSNBC or whatever channel it is, it's it's all bullshit. And you go on social media, it's all bullshit. But you sit people down and people are reasonable. And it's just like I feel like politics and the media has been gamed for financial incentives to stoke division and it's horrible. It's just shit. And there's a significant part of my book that breaks down the dynamics you're describing. Yeah. And yes, uh, it is being gamed for financial reasons on both sides. Polarization is at record highs. It's why we feel so negatively about the prospects of the people somehow coming together in the future because they're getting rewarded for being more unreasonable yep. and polarizing. And it's sad. And it's it's funny, the, the COVID lens, I don't really want to talk to you about COVID today, but the COVID lens is really interesting because it's just an example how everything becomes politicized here in the US. If you go to the UK, whether you want to you know, be vaccinated, wearing a mask, it's got nothing to do whether you're conservative or labor, it's just personal opinion. We, we don't have that polarization around every topic that you have here. And I don't know how it's fixed. I, hopefully you have a solution to it, but I don't know how it's fixed. All I know is it's just not working. It's, it's really hard to watch as somebody is a fan of the US. Yeah, it, it, it's rough that everything has been politicized in this way. It's part of this polarization uh, dynamic where if you had a more multipolar system, then it would not be this extreme or ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, and to your point about Bitcoin, I agree that you don't want it to become politicized. I'm going to just break it down in a very, very simple way for, for folks. At this point, the Democratic Party is the party of the fading establishment. And then the Republican Party has been overtaken by anti-institutionalist zeal. So then if, if you just use that as your framework, then you think, okay, I can see why Republicans are generally more down with Bitcoin, whereas the Dems will be more skeptical or negative. Uh, and uh, we have to try and prevent that where Bitcoin is concerned because you don't want it to become a political football uh, and you want to help Democrats who are at least putatively pro-innovation and uh, development um, to understand that, like you said, Bitcoin's a tool. Hmm. So what's involved in creating a, a new party? And, and 
I'm assuming some people have attempted to do this before and it hasn't, you know, obviously it hasn't worked. What's involved in creating a new party? And in doing this, are you essentially running for president again? Good questions. I'll answer directly what it takes to start a political party in the United States of America. Yep. So you have to get recognized by a federal agency called the FEC. Um, uh, I think it stands for like Federal Elections Commission or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, to say you're a political party, there's a test. Uh, so um, you have to have chapters in various states. You have to have uh, people who are um, running, um, at least for some office. You need to have meetings. Like it, it, It's sort of fun. Um, so... Right now, we're on that path to start uh, getting recognized as a political party. Uh, and the reason why third parties have not taken off is because the mechanics prevent it. Right. Right now, 62% of Americans actually want an alternative to the duopoly. But if you try and vote in your local election, the odds are very high that you can only meaningfully participate as either a Democrat or Republican because of closed party primaries. So that is the shift we have to make. This what is does that mean, closed party primaries? Sure. So I'll use New York City as an example. Uh, I ran for mayor here. Democrats vastly outnumber anyone else here. So there's a Democratic primary in June. And in order to participate, you need to have been a registered Democrat since February. So if someone showed up and said, like, hey, I'd like to support Yang, you can't do it unless you're a registered Democrat from four months ago. So in point of fact, the Democrats essentially control who's going to win not just that primary, but because Democrats outnumber everyone else here so significantly, that person will almost certainly win the, the general race. So that dynamic extends throughout the country. 83% okay. of congressional seats, for example, are in very blue or very red areas. So if you win your party's primary, then you win the general. So the people who have control over who is going to emerge, it's all uh, partisans who are already registered in a particular party. So if you're a new person running as a forwardist or a libertarian or whatever, you will almost certainly have no chance to win. Right. Th this is why, and I'm just going to guess that a lot of people listening to this are libertarians, and you look around and you're like, where are the libertarian uh, elected officials? Like, well, a duopoly essentially prevents it. Okay. So that's what the forward party is trying to change. And anyone who's an experienced libertarian is totally down with this because they're like, oh, we've wanted to do this for years, which is you want to break up this party primary that controls everything early on and turn it into an open primary where the top five candidates get through. And if you had the top five candidates, then you'd have a libertarian. You'd have a forwardist. You'd have someone else where it's not just always a Republican or a Democrat. But until you make that mechanic shift, you will almost certainly never have a chance to compete. And that's what the duopoly is using to suppress everyone else. It's really messed up when mm. you reflect on it for a minute. It's like, hey, 62% of us want an alternative, but the duopoly sets up the elections to make it next to impossible. And if you look again, not in the Constitution, the two parties came into existence years and decades later, and then they set this up at the state level. It's all made up bullshit, essentially. It's like the, the fact that like it's a closed party primary, it's just the party, um, the parties made these rules up to try and suppress competition, if this sounds familiar to anyone. So, <laughs> so, so, so the key mission of the forward party is to enable genuine competition politically. And I'm going to suggest to people listening to this that this is going to be good for Bitcoin in a couple of ways. Number one, if you're the Democrats and you're just competing against the Republicans, then this can become a political issue. But if you have, let's say, the forward party comes in, it's like, hey, we're pro-Bitcoin, we're pro-cryptocurrency, then all of a sudden there's actually more viable competition where Democrats are like, oh, God, are we really going to be the anti-crypto yeah, yeah. <laughs> like party? The, the second thing, and this is key for you all, Bitcoin right now is a you know, whatever, one and a half trillion dollar ecosystem or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily, if you have an industry anywhere near that scale, you know what you have? Fucking lobbyists. You have like a giant freaking, and you know, you know who- It's, it's starting to happen. I know, it is starting to happen. Yeah. And I, I actually am happy to say I started an organization that has lobbyists who are working on a number of issues in Congress, and this is one of them. So- like, you know, we're aligned, the forward party's aligned. If you want to help us, but you need some freaking lobbyists. And my organization, Humanity Forward, uh, has hired at this point dozens of lobbyists mm -hmm. uh, who have worked on Capitol Hill and know their way around. But you can see this with every other major industry where why, you know, does pharma have its way? Because they hire a truck ton of lobbyists and they get in there and use their resources. Right now, the Bitcoin community is a little bit behind the curve, though I know it's speeding up very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I like to help make that happen through both Humanity Forward 
and the forward party, where if we get the resources, then we can actually plug in. And I've seen how effective it is lobbying on Capitol Hill. That shit works. Uh, you know, I mean, you've seen it with Senator Loomis. You've yep. seen it with some 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 different senators. Now we need to get some Democratic um, senators on board. We need some Democratic legislators to see the light. Um, but we're here to help. Funding this though it must be costing a lot of money. Are you taking donors who would normally be funding Democratic politicians, or Republican politicians to do this? Because I can't imagine this is cheap. We want to build a popular movement. It's mm -hmm. really of the people. And so we're taking individual donations from just Americans who just think shit isn't working and they want it to work better. Um, now, to your question, it's like, hey, can we compete and contend with the Republican and Democratic uh, machines and infrastructures? We're going to find out. I mean, uh, I think uh, if enough of us get together, then sure, we can compete because they're so rickety and no one likes them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do have billions of dollars in resources, and we're going to have to try and rival that. So here's my vision. I yeah. hope people get, get into this. So here's this duopoly. It's terrible. Uh, but you can't make it go away unless you change the mechanics. So we need to change the mechanics. Now, that's going to require a popular movement. It's going to require resources and money. So can we get the resources from the people? Let's find out. Uh, you know, forwardparty.com if anyone wants to lend a hand. Uh, and then we'll also build, and you'll love this okay. because this is up your alley, Peter. We also need to build up a parallel media infrastructure mm -hmm. to rival the corporate media that is on both sides. We have do. To, we have to build this whole new system, both politically, financially, which is uh, what, what you all are about, and then uh, with the media. You, and messaging. But you don't want to have a new media arm that's co-opted by the Ford Party, almost like this decentralized media of people that you can rely on. Like you were on Rogan and you know, people trust him and you know, I have this. Like all these decentralized platforms, these independents, I think are the, gonna be the people who are interested in this. Hundred percent. And so my, my thesis is that in the new world, people don't trust institutions. Yep. People just trust people. They yep. trust you, Peter, they trust Rich, they trust Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. trust Sam Harris, let's say. Uh, and and so one of my goals is to build a constellation of trusted voices and have it uh, start to rival the traditional players. Because if we wait for the traditional players, uh, we'll be waiting too long. I mean, it already is. I and mean, the big fight Rogan had this last couple of weeks with CNN, I think, proves that people distrust CNN and they trust Rogan. Not everyone, but I, I think I think the swing is starting to happen. It's starting to happen among young people. But yeah. here's where politics comes back into it. Peter, it's the boomers. Uh, it, so it turns out that the relationship with the news media is highly party dependent. Okay. What do I mean? Democrats, 69% have a high trust in media. Republicans, 15%. Very, very different. Independents, 36%, somewhere in between. So if, if you use as the simplest framing, but I, I like simple framing, uh, CNN versus Rogan. You're really looking at Democrats versus independents and Republicans. Interesting. Now, independents. And Republicans certainly outnumber everyone else by a lot. Like the the self identification goes something like forty four percent independent, twenty eight percent Democrat, and then something like twenty six percent Republican. So, what is success for you? If you look in, I don't know, one, two, three, four years, is it by winning a seat, getting somebody in the Senate, getting somebody in Congress? You've just got one person, and do you prove the thesis and continue? Well, in this system, it would be an enormous victory to win, for example, one Senate seat. Mm -hmm. Can we win one, one Senate seat November 22? Yes, we can. And so one of the things that I want to point out to people is like if you listen to what I'm saying right now, um, there's this vast unaffiliated political group. It's aligned with libertarians. It's uh, centrist, as I, I believe that you describe yourself. Uh, and this body tends not to be as organized. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of the things that has the capacity to fuck us, honestly. <laughs> if, if the reasonable, untapped middle were to coalesce, then we win. We transform everything. Now, you don't need 51% of people in this middle, though that is mathematically what it could add up to. If you get about 10% of us super animated and energized, is that going to be enough in the way of energy and resources to help tip a Senate race to an aligned independent I believe it is. Can we win a number of congressional seats? I believe we can. Can you win a few local races? Yes. Can you maybe get some of these states to adopt open primaries and ranked choice voting via ballot initiative also next November? What's ranked choice voting? So ranked choice voting, so the, the 
framework I'm describing is that, that you get rid of party primaries and then anyone can run under any party. Mm-hmm. Now, you want a certain number of candidates to come through to the general election. So let's call it five, which is what we're proposing and fighting for. Now, if you have five candidates come through, but let's say two of them are Democrats, one's Republican, one's a, a Libertarian, one's a Forwardist, then the two Democrats cannibalize each other and then everyone gets mad or two okay. Republicans cannibalize each other or whatever. So you use something called rank choice voting, which is a voting system where you get to rank up to five candidates in order, one, two, three, four, five, or you can just vote for one person and walk out. Um, but the system enables you not to have any spoiler effect because the winner has to get 50.1% of people's first place votes. Okay. And then the weakest candidate, then their second place votes go up to the first place and you continue the process until someone wins a majority. Okay. So you need to do this if you're going to have five candidates of different parties because it prevents someone from getting super mad that there are two people from the same party in that race. Doesn't seem there would be any interest to change that system from the people within, though. Yeah, you noticed that. Yeah, huh? kind I mean, of that, obvious, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I got to do this. All right, so yeah. here's here's my argument for why it will happen, despite what Peter just said. Yeah. Number one, it has already happened in one state. Okay, Alaska made this change last year. Two, there are 24 states that allow you to do this via ballot initiative, and so if you went to the average person in Utah or Missouri uh, or Massachusetts and said, "Hey," Would you like to have more say over who represents you uh, and not make it just the province of the parties? A lot of people will be like, yeah, that sounds good to me. And then say, well, if you make this switch, then we can do that. Uh, And so this is the task of the forward party is to activate this energy. Because anyone looking at it would be like, oh, of course I prefer that. Why would I want the parties to have a stranglehold on everything? Everyone hates that shit. (laughs) But we all allow it because we've been sedated and duped into thinking that this is a law of nature when it's not. It's just made up bullshit like a lot of other things. So that is the challenge. Now, is it easy? No, it's very hard. Uh, Is it achievable though? Yes. So if you have these 24 states, let's say I had an unlimited amount of money. It doesn't Mm -hmm. even need to be unlimited. Let's call it, you know, $100 million. You run these ballot initiatives in multiple states. Let's call it 10 states. Maybe you win five. You win five, that's a game changer because plus Alaska, that'd be six. Then all of a sudden you'd have a bunch of legislators who have better incentives because they have to appeal to 50.1% of us instead of just a 10 to 20% hyper-partisans. I mean, that's a major. Do you think that might be good for Bitcoin? Think about this for a second. If you have people, legislators, who are trying to please 50.1% of the population, then they'll be a, a lot more inclined to be like, oh, there are some people who hold Bitcoin in my district, so I don't want to shit on them. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I'm just answering to the 10 to 20% most hyper-partisan Democrats, who are, by the way, the most establishment-y, <laughs> you know, like, that's a different equation, right? Like You can see in the 50.1% version, they might be like, oh, maybe I shouldn't kill this freaking thing. Whereas if, if they're just talking to the establishment types, then maybe they will. Are you running... You running yourself in the primaries next year as a forward party in a particular seat? Uh, so for 2022, my job is to elevate other candidates okay. and try and make sure that some of these goals get achieved. But you seem like the easy win, the guy, because you already have the platform. People know you. People trust you. People might be like, "Yeah, I I would vote for Andrew. I would vote for another party." Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to elevate the forward party. Yeah. I mean, it's a big job. Um, so, you know, nothing's off the table. I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, just like I said, it's yeah. like you just do whatever the organization needs, you know? You're still working while, while you're doing this as well. <laughs> well, this is my work now yeah. because it's kind of a big job. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough where enough people support me where I can do this as a job and not have my wife leave me or any of that jazz. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of work, but someone's got to do it, right? I mean, there are a lot of people who are listening to this too. I think it's like, You know, they're just like, oh, thank God someone normal is trying to make some changes in the system because it's not going to come from within the machine. (laughs) I mean, you could sense that. Well, I mean, look, I didn't agree with what he was, the the approach, but when Brett Weinstein was looking at doing something different last year, I think it was last year. Yeah, it was last year. 2020, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it seemed interesting. It was somebody who was saying, look, this is broken. Let's do something different. I mean, I... I think a third party was needed, not not really their idea, but I think a lot of people will support this. This, This political fight, it feels... 
It feels like a red herring. It doesn't feel like the reality of the ground. We're it's, being we're being duped. We're yeah. being set up. It's going to lead to violence. I mean, it, it's really well, it tragic has and terrible. In some ways. It already has. Yeah, yeah. So, I, we can see it. The dynamics. I mean, it's the market. The market's setting us against each other. So, so policy wise, where is the forward party? And and do you see yourself as a party in the center? Are you more left than the Democrats? Like. Where do you see yourself? Well, first, uh, I think we have to try and rid ourselves of the ideological buckets because that's okay. also a media creation. Right. The media is okay. always just trying to set us up in that way. Uh, the forward party's main goal is just to make the system work. Mm-hmm. So people who are libertarian or socialist or whatever the fuck, like, uh, like everyone should be on board trying to make these changes just mm-hmm. so the system is more responsive to anyone that's not a Democrat or Republican. <laughs> you know, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, so that's our primary mission, and so I'm trying to focus on that. Uh, you know, there are people who agree or disagree with me on various things. I mean, if you looked at my presidential platform, you probably have a get a sense of where I stand. Mm-hmm. But I'm at a point now where I think that nothing will work and nothing will matter unless we actually get into the guts of the problem. And so, if someone disagrees with me on a particular issue, I'll be like, "Look, can we agree on that?" You know, like I, I'm I'm kind of a practical dude that way. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I I think that everything else should be kind of secondary or, or wait for a little while until we fix this. Well, so let's talk about the UBI thing because that's the, the main issue I think people know you for. It's a big topic you talked about. I listened to you talk to Rogan about it. Um, I'm not a libertarian. I like a lot of what libertarians stand for. I'm a, a like a reluctant believer in democracy and with all its flaws. We um, got to believe in it, man. Or yeah. else, I mean, you know, what's the alternative? Um, oh, well, the alternative could be. I know what the alternative yeah. sort of is. That's cool. Well, I, <laughs> there are a couple alternatives, I guess. In, in the UK, I'm considered a conservative. All my conservative friends here think I'm progressive and a liberal. Um, uh, I'm kind of politically homeless, but I, I'm I'm interested in all. You know, politically ideas. homeless people are probably forwardists, but continue. Yeah. Well, no. So, I'm, but this idea of UBI, I'm like, hmm, okay, I, I need to hear about. It. I need you to explain it to me. I want to talk it through with you because um, I can see functional reasons for having it. I mean. All the different social programs we have in the UK, the bureaucracy around them is ridiculous and they're constantly changing and tweaking and we have these huge government departments and when somebody says the idea of, you know, scrap it all, we'll just have one payment that everyone receives and that would reduce costs, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But then sometimes the economics of the entire program don't seem to work for me and, like, I just wanted to hear from you. Um, You obviously believe there's a a big issue coming with automation, what that's going to cause to the different uh, markets that affects and also this kind of growing wealth divide Let's um, talk to me about it because this seems to be the the biggest issue that you focus on. I, I ran for president because I believe that our economy is transforming before our eyes, and a lot of people are not going to fare well mm-hmm. uh, as a result. Uh, and so you have to look at it and say, okay, what do you do at scale? A- and the talking points, which are bullshit, are around retraining people. Which doesn't work. Government retraining programs always yeah. fail. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's the kind of thing where it's like, oh, we're retraining everyone. It's like, oh, okay, okay. But then if you go to the community, which I have, no one's getting retrained. Mm-hmm. You know, they're more likely to go home and um, drink themselves to death, or you know, like have something negative happen. I mean, that that's much more normal. So, so if you push that aside for a moment, you say, okay, like, what can you actually do to help people meaningfully transition? And one of the things that the government can actually deliver on in real life is putting some money into people's hands. I mean, mm-hmm. we're seeing that in different ways. So that, to me, was the best, most sensible approach. Um, and I, I'm not a huge fan of bureaucracy. People can probably sense that. Uh, right now, a lot of these government programs are administered in a way that's really punitive and dehumanizing. Mm-hmm. They just kind of treat you like a rat in a maze. And I talk to people around these programs, and they live in constant fear and anxiety of missing a meeting or having mm-hmm. like a forum not filled out right and losing their benefits. It's, it's a terrible way to live. So uh, I, I believe it'd be much better uh, economically, socially, and culturally if we just said, look, you're a human being. Here's a, a straight cash payment. Uh, and oh, by the way, that money would end up flowing back into their local economy. It would help small businesses grow. It would, it would lead to people becoming more entrepreneurial and uh, creative and risk taking. Um, so I, I thought this was the best approach. So the people I've spoken to about it, and like I said, I'm not an expert. They've, I actually spoke to a guy yesterday. He thinks it's great. He said, "Let's let's do this. Let's let's create a new program. Let's test it out." But but the people I spoke to are critical of it. Say the potential disincentive to work, which I'm sh- everything I'm going to say. You've you've heard, heard it before. Sure. But 
let's go through it today. And and also, the, it's still as a program itself, it's like would cost trillions to implement. And yeah, we're already in a uh, position now where there's high inflation, probably much higher than quoted. You know, does this just add to the inflation problems we have already? Like, how do you? F- let's let's just deal with them both. The disincentive to work. How do you feel about that? When you obviously disagree. Sure. Well, right now we have the most powerful disincentives to work, which is we give you cash and say, if you start working, we'll take the money away. <laughs> That's like every unemployment program we have. Yep. I talk to 26 year olds who say to me, look, I'm making whatever, 500 bucks a, a week not working, uh, which is not quite what I was making working, but not that far from it. So I'm going to wait until these benefits run out before I start looking for work. And I hear this and say, that's perfectly reasonable and rational. Now, if they were getting a certain amount of money and they could keep it, and if they started working it at, stacked on top, would they start looking? They'd at least be more open to it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like you, you don't want to reward people for not working, which is what we do a lot right now. And to the, to people who uh, are you know imagining the situation in like a green field, I mean, the fact is right now millions of Americans are getting money mm-hmm. that gets taken away from them if they start working. So if you're worried about dis- disincentive to work, I mean, it's it's like baked that into already the, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it already exists. It's very, very baked into the system. Um, so that that's one of the things that I saw a lot on the trail and also said very consistently to people. It's like, look, it, it's already out there. <laughs> like that's In the worst way possible, by the way. You have like people who are disabled uh, who are afraid to volunteer at their local church or nonprofit because they're afraid someone will think that they're abled and then take the money away. I mean, shit like that. Yeah. It's like, I think we can all agree that person should just go volunteer at the church and they can have the... <laughs> Contribute to society, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's better. Just be better. Um, now, to the inflation issue, we're pumping a lot of money into the economy, but not through people. Mm-hmm. If you look at the CARES Act, the $2.2 trillion that went out, 83% of it went to institutions and maybe 17% went to people. And so the, the money's out there um, but it's not actually making anyone's life that much better. It's mm-hmm. going to banks and airlines and, and other actors. Uh, and if you look at what, what's happening in terms of inflation, um, a lot of that is centered on three areas, or historically, I mean, right now it's kind of everywhere because of supply chain issues. But historically, it's been education, healthcare, and housing. And those markets are just kind of uh, distinct in that they just think you have no choice but to pay. Uh, there's not competition in the same way there is for this laptop or your shirt or whatever. <laughs> you know, like like there, you notice prices actually are pretty manageable. They even sort of come down for the quality. Um, so if you look at them in turn, education, they just raise the prices every year and then you pass it through to the government or in loans, which is why we have, by the way, 1.6 trillion plus in in school loans. So it's a you know messed up system. Mm-hmm. Healthcare similar where they, you pass it through to insurance carriers and the prices just go up and up to the moon and everyone like is crying about it because it doesn't make any sense. Um, so these are areas where it hasn't related to the fact that people had buying power. It's not like college got more expensive because everyone had lots of money for it. It's just people felt like they had to borrow more. And then housing, it's dependent in large part on uh, zoning regs and various communities. So the point I'm making is that most of the most agreed disinflation is not because of buying power in people's hands. It's because of dysfunctional marketplaces. So if you put money into people's hands, it actually helps manage the those cost increases and makes the market more competitive because people will actually be able to participate in different ways. So you, I, you wouldn't see a lot of the consumer staples shoot up in price as a result. You haven't seen it now. Um, to the extent that it's happening now, it's because of supply chain issues that hopefully, God willing, um, are not permanent. Yeah, interesting that you should make that point because um, my understanding, basic understanding of inflation is that if we increase the money supply, I mean, there are supply chain issues which are leading to price increases at the moment. We're seeing that especially in the UK, but we also, also, also we are also seeing uh, big problems in the energy sector in the UK. But my understanding is if you continually increase the money supply, you will always see inflation and my understanding of UBI is that it's it still would cost trillions to do. Like, what what percentage of GDP would it? You could do it in different ways. Okay. Uh, the the cost would be in you know the low trillions, yeah. shall we say? But the thing again, I want to emphasize is that we're already pumping this money into the system. It's just not going through anyone's hands. 
Uh, like we printed four trillion dollars for the Wall Street bailout. CARES Act is two point two, and that was before the rescue plan, which is another one point two. Like we're already pumping the money into the system. We're just doing it really, really inefficiently and ineffectively, in my opinion. But isn't the answer to, to trying to get to a situation where we aren't pumping trillions and trillions more in because of the impact that's having? And that if we if you to move to a UBI system, there is a risk that it's a continuation. Because I mean, the US didn't used to pump this much. We go even back to two thousand eight. Was it like? Oh, about eight hundred billion that was pumped in in the housing crisis. I think I think it's about then. So there, there was an eight hundred billion dollar yeah. uh, stimulus package during that time, but there was also four trillion printed for uh, for the banks. Uh, like shouldn't 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 the Fed begin back to a point where it runs a like a deficit and a sur- surplus, you know, depending on the economic situation, try and have a more stable currency. Ideally, our goal should not to be in an environment where everyone assumes a certain level of inflation. And again, mm. if you look at all of the sources of inflation historically, in my mind, it's been a massive government failure that we've allowed education and healthcare in particular to rise to the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have technology and innovation, a lot of things should be getting cheaper, but we make it such that that's the opposite yep. of, of the model. Um, so I was talking to, um, you know, uh, Jeff Booth Jeff about Jeff Booth. This. I was just about to say, if you spoke to Jeff Booth, yeah, uh, and, it tomorrow. Yes, and and he's uh, very smart and right that we need to be enabling deflation in more of these areas. So they take education, which is an example. Like, mm-hmm. can we imagine cheaper, more effective ways to deliver education to people? Of course, we can. Like anyone listening to this can. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the, the problem is that you know that that competition hasn't been allowed to take place because we are deeply subsidizing current legacy providers. So if you were to make big moves in that direction, you could attack inflation uh, where it is in the economy. And that's what I think we should be doing at a much, much higher level. What would you do with healthcare? Because that's what freaks me out most about this country. Like if I was to come and live here. Which you should. Let's all welcome Peter to the US of A. Ah! Let me in. Oh, some people listening to this are like, boo, because some of you yeah. are probably something like, else. That's piss right. off. Still, British, Andrew Yang yeah. still in America, booster. Yeah. You know, what can I say? Come on, help help me get can we get a green card? Uh, but look, the in the U- our president, man, I would fucking knight that shit immediately. Yeah, be like Just, bang, dude, bang. I I'd, I'd have a dude with me. It would be like give Peter a green card. It'd be like bang. I'm chatting to my brother. I'd be like, Let's just call out the president. We got, <laughs> yeah. we got this shit covered. Get President Yang on the yeah, phone. Get Yang on the phone. Come I, say, on, man. I, I kid you all not. President Yang would have a, a green card guy. And then anyone really awesome that we know is awesome would be like, this person definitely deserves a green card because you can fucking tell. You think I'm awesome? You can tell within 10 yeah. seconds if someone Come should uh, get a green card. I, I, I have friends who are awesome Canadians who have a hard time staying here. And I'm like, this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen. This person clearly just makes everything better. And it takes 10 seconds for any sane person to see that. President Yang's green card guy, <laughs> give this awesome Canadian a green card and then we just continue that process. And this British guy and get some awesome awesome tea here as well because the tea here is fucking terrible. I'm telling no, I'm you. I'm sorry. It's terrible. I believe you. Everything else, everything else is great. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh no, healthcare because like in the UK we, we have um, the NHS which my libertarian friends here hate because they're like oh it's a socialist system and I always try and explain to them it's like yeah it is but anyone at any point heart attack, broken leg they get they can get seen they can get treated. They don't have a uh, they don't have a a bill that might hit them that decimates decimates their economic position for years, maybe decades. And you know what? Even if you don't like the wait list, you know, if you're moderate income, you can go private. It's 150 pound a month, and you have full covering, including cancer care. You can go to private doctors now, 50 pound for an appointment. I quite like our system. Now, our medicine isn't as advanced as the US. If you have serious like childhood cancers. Most of the time, you're fundraising to come here to be treated because the, the the level of treatment you can get here is a lot better. But the healthcare system here freaks me out. It's the one thing that does. Like, it feels messy. What, where do you stand on this? What you do not think that the U.S. healthcare system is the, 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 the think, quote unquote best in the world? I, I should stop laughing. I mean, it is on the you know, on no, certain no, no. aspects. It is. I mean, but, we're, we're we're the best in the world if you just looked at total dollars spent. Of course, um, you know, we're we're one of the worst if you're talking about actual uh, ease of use or um, navigating the bureaucracy or the principal agent problem or or anything else. 
Um, so I think most people know this. If you have means, you'll be fine in the U.S. Cool. So you know that that's one thing you can count on about America is that if you have money, you can figure it out. Though it is a little bit more painful to figure it out than that, you'd like. That, that's kind of the case anyway. If you've got the money anyway, you, it, it's it's the it's the people who are lowest in society who don't like. How do we protect those? Totally agree. Yeah. So I'm a market guy. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people know that. But healthcare is not something that you should allow just someone to go into the market because there's an information asymmetry. Sometimes you're literally in a failed state of mind because you know you got clonked in the head or you're about to die or whatever it is. And if someone runs over to you, they'll be like, you know, it's like you know you're not exactly like Mister uh, Efficient Marketplace Rational Actor at, mm-hmm. at, at that moment. Um, so there are a number of reasons why. You don't want to make healthcare like a purely just let the consumer figure it out marketplace. And yep. so once you get over that hurdle, then you think, okay, like how should we be providing this? There should, in my opinion, be a base level of healthcare available to everyone in society. Uh, and by the way, that base layer already kind of exists. It's just called the emergency room, and it's the worst thing you want because it's more costly. It waits until the person's already fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, like this. This, you know, having ERs be your primary care is hella dumb. Mm-hmm. So uh, the other thing about it, and this this is an emblem of the American system. I talk about this in my last book, The War on Normal People, that. Uh, the healthcare industry just keeps on growing and growing. I think now it's up to something like 18% of the economy. But you know what is not changing? Our healthcare outcomes. It's just like a lot of things in American life where it just fucking grows and grows. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's delivering value. It's just like college yeah. tuition bills just grow and grow. It's like, did colleges get twice as good? No, you know, since I went. It's gotten two and a half times more expensive. So it's like, oh, did shit get better? It's like, not let me, really. Let me give you a funny anecdote. When I come here, I always like just put on the TV and watching the adverts because every third advert is for some condition. Some fucking drug? Some drug for a condition I've never fucking heard of. And then there's like this very fast spoken ending which like basically covers Ask your all. doctor about him. Yeah, ask your you doctor know. and you know it might be some some condition I've never heard of and it'll be like, yeah, these are all the potential outcomes. You you know, if you've got you could heart die. condition you could die. <laughs> yeah, this, you could yeah, die. Yeah. You know, Dude, like, I used to parody those ads on the trail. I'd be like yeah, you know so there we, should, we should not we should not have those companies have the ability to advertise on television the way they do or on the internet and the rest of it. You know who doesn't allow it? Just about every other developed country. Mm-hmm. It does not make sense to essentially just try and turn your population into a, a bunch of um, you know, fearful psychosomatic types uh, <laughs> or hypochondriacs. Yeah, hypochondriacs. <laughs> yeah. And, and what, to make a buck? Like there are a lot of really stupid things about um, America's healthcare system. I And I, I think if you had a base level of care, um, it would help rationalize things. The truth of it is that, and I described it with with colleges, is that you've allowed this system to just go completely amok. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend who's an investor who said to me, Andrew, if you were to rationalize what's going on in these industries, you would short a lot of these companies because they just keep on profiteering and profiteering. And some of this stuff, one of the things I I found out when I was uh, running for president, there's a guy named Dean Kamen, American genius, brilliant inventor. Mm -hmm. Invented something called portable dialysis, would improve the lifestyle of a lot of people who are struggling with uh, diabetes and whatnot. So everyone uses it, right? And then you kind of know how the story ends. No, because some company figured it would lose a billion dollars if people didn't have to go to dialysis centers and the plug in and have shitty lives. And so they they like managed to fight against portable dialysis. That's the kind of bullshit that's going on in the American system. Oh man, that's so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm sorry if I unsold Peter on coming to America. No, that, no, that, do you not? Like going down. There's, like I say, there's a lot I love about it. coming to America. I, uh, for me, as somebody who runs a business, I find people want you to succeed here. They really do, and they'll get behind you. And things happen fast and quick here. You know, you make a call and someone wants to meet, and it just happens. Andrew Yang just appears, just out of nowhere. Out of just the poof. elevator. I just poof. come out. <laughs> just do this. But like, so there's a lot I like, but also it just feels like the U.S. Has has really got to this broken point where, and I, I bring it back to the money, which is you know ov- obviously because of Bitcoin, but it feels like where the big pots of money are, that's where everything goes a bit skewy. There's you know corruption or misaligned incentives, and that's that's the bit that I feel like the politics should be fixing. That's the bit the politicians should be fixing, but some of them seem to be benefiting from this as well. Yeah, that, that's a pretty good summary. I, I think you understand <laughs> what's going yeah. on pretty well. So yeah. I I do again want to want to point out. 
you know, like where we need to go. Because I'm uh-huh. a doer, I'm a solutions oriented person. Let's say again, you have a you know 1.5 trillion dollar uh, asset class or community or industry mm-hmm. in the form of Bitcoin. And then you have politicians who don't understand it are looking up being like, oh, what are we going to do? And then some of them have banks whispering in their ear being like, kill it, kill it. Get rid of that. Kill it, it, kill it. We don't some treasury it. officials being like, kill it. Get rid of it. We hate it. And, and then... <laughs> Brett, Brett Sherman. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you have some other uh, legislators who are just trying to figure it out and get into it. Like, what we have to do is we have to make the case to them, look... This is good for innovation, good for jobs, good for progress, good for value creation. And we have to avoid it becoming a political football. We have to make it so it isn't just like the red-blue dynamic where mm-hmm. the Republicans were like, yeah, and the Democrats are like, kill it, kill it. Which is the natural place it will go because yep. of this kind of pro-establishment, anti-establishment dynamic that mm-hmm. I described. So we have to run, not walk to trying to make the case to a handful of Democratic legislators that, look, this is – Pro civilization. Uh, this is going to help solve lots of problems. Mm-hmm. Like, do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Will there be some reasonable middle ground approach? Let's go there. Like, don't don't come yep. in like guns blazing and be like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> like, don't do anything. But just come and say, "Look, let's take a reasonable middle ground approach that doesn't end up pushing this industry offshore, pushing this community offshore." Like, that's the danger. That's a language that can win. But we have to take that case to them as quickly as possible because, you know, they could just turn up, they could wake up tomorrow and do something stupid. We all know that. <laughs> so, so we have to take this case to them immediately. And the two vessels I'm going to suggest, like I'm working on this, are the Forward Party and Humanity Forward. Humanity Forward is the lobbying organization that's trying mm-hmm. to make good things happen on Capitol Hill. They employ dozens of lobbyists. You can check them out. Great team. And the Forward Party is this popular political movement that will hopefully rationalize our political incentives and make it so that legislators have to answer to the broad public as opposed to uh, just the hyper-partisans, but it'll also create a more uh, vibrant, competitive marketplace for the Democrats in particular to say, look, I, I can't just shit on things because there's like another party that represents the future or progress, you know, and the rest of it that that is going to um, paint me with a negative brush, but also bring some fucking uh, gunpowder to the fight. It's like, you know, if, if forward party has votes, money, et cetera, politicians, and this everyone should understand this, politicians are creatures of the market. What market are they responding to? Their political incentives, their mm-hmm. donors, the media. So what do we have to do? We have to create our own political incentives and donors and the media to stand up for Bitcoin and progress and the rest of it, or else we're going to wind up on the cutting room floor. It's a, it's a very American idea, Bitcoin, though. I feel it is. It I, it is. I mean, it, it's you know. I, I guess some people would would say it. It kind of has that John Wayne Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just of. think it's just like the proof of work idea. The the, the behind uh, Bitcoin. I think the fact that it protects property rights. Yeah, it's, you know, That's it's in, innovative. It just feels like a scary thing where you've got you know people like Janet Yellen who who want to tax billionaires and. Uh, and uh, take the unrealized gains, and they want to track, you know, track six hundred dollar transactions. That kind of all weird dystopian stuff. But I think Bitcoin is a very American idea, and I also think geopolitically, for America to have the advantage on a on the global scale, it's a really important issue. And it's a very to, important issue to harm that would be damaging to the America. You know, I tweeted the other day, and people probably saw it. Is like if you have a trillion dollar industry that could define the future, try not to screw it up. Yeah, I mean that's a reasonable summary. You know, I mean we should just try not to fuck it up. I think I think I know what your problem is going to be is that you are reasonable and rational and you're making sense. <laughs> and well, what we have to do is activate the reasonable, rational folks who, frankly, have just avoided politics like the plague. Because yep. I get it, the rational thing to do has been to avoid American politics. <laughs> I get that, but we have to change that, or else again they're going to do something stupid and it's going to be very regrettable. You're going to need to build a, a good team around you of people who. You know, share your vision. Uh, are charismatic, can get out there, can debate. Can oh, what you nominating yourself? <laughs> I can't do it. I'm a, I can't do it. I'm a, I'm a foreigner. I'm a foreigner. I'm a British, so we can't do it. But uh, I mean, just it's finding those people who want to do this to put themselves out there because it's. it's I'm sure it's a bruising experience for you as well. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's been bruising, but rewarding, gratifying, invigorating. You know, I'm just a dude who three years ago no one had heard of, and and now I'm someone who can see. Frankly, just how, how dystopian things threaten to get. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm also one of the handful of people who might be able to do something about it. So I'm going to do everything I can to do something about it. Uh, And one of the things that's happened to me over the last number of years, which I'm so grateful for, is that other people have said, yeah, like I'm on board. Let's do it. You know, like if Andrew Yang was still just like the lone voice wandering in the wilderness, then I'm not here having this conversation with you and like, you know, a lot of other things. Um, But a, a lot of people are sick and tired of the bullshit and the nonsense and they see what's happening and they're like, we can do better than this. Uh, it, it's wild how singular a figure I am in American politics because I'm not a creature of this marketplace. Like mm-hmm. the market's just creating certain types of actors. And I, you know what I am? I'm someone who sees the need and then goes towards it and says, let the market form around me in this solution because there have to be people that care enough about it to invest in it. And I've been happy that people have, have invested in it thus far. Well, I think I think the timing's right because... Yeah, U.S. politics isn't a mess. Uh, You are coming out of this whole COVID situation, which has polarized people again. There are big issues in many of the states. I mean, I think there's big issues here in New York and San Francisco and different parts of the U.S. Um, But we're at a time where the the money printer is going crazy. There's a massive wealth divide. The middle class is being like everybody knows this bullshit now. Everyone is everyone Everyone can see through it. Everyone can see through it. Like the veil's been lifted. And you've got someone, just a person like a Rogan, who can stand there and say, I'm not going to take this bullshit. And I think people are looking for someone they can believe in, like yourself, and go, do you know what? I actually fucking trust you. Like This is something different. But it's like, how do you make this happen? How do you accelerate this? And I guess that's... It really comes down to enough of us getting together and saying enough is enough. We can do better than this. Uh, you know, I mean, like the passive version is like, I'm going to uh, watch Joe Rogan instead of other things. And I don't worry, I'm into that. I mean, mm-hmm. I owe Joe Rogan a great deal. Like, you know, he helped launch my presidential campaign. But, but it's around enough of us taking various stands, taking action, making decisions, making investments. Uh, you know, it was on Joe Rogan's podcast where I said to him, I was like, look, if enough of us get together, we can fucking you know, disrupt the system. Uh-huh. And then a lot of his listeners were like, hell yeah. And then they donated whatever, 25 bucks to my campaign, which added up to 40 million. So, wow. I mean, I'm like super grateful. Um, we need to do it again. Yeah, and you're going back on. Uh, I, yeah, I am going back on. Good. I don't have a date yet, but, you know, we're in touch with his people. Well, I'd love to hear it. I think he's a brilliant interviewer. That's when I first became fully aware of you, listened to that interview. And, uh, like, it's been great to get you on this show. I think, I think the Bitcoiners, the ones who are, politically motivated a little bit will get behind you others will be like you're just another politician but i think the bitcoiners will get behind you they want something different i think just people want something different we're all fucking fed up with this shit you should be fed up this yeah. is fucking bullshit you know we can all, we can all, we can I mean, all see it i say it like i'm an american i'm actually a british person and like it's not it's not i so think bad you might have the same uh, perspective a uh, fresher perspective because I'm, I'm the son of immigrants right and so a lot of stuff where i'm just like you know you learn things about this country growing up and then you're like oh interesting this is, you know i mean i think in in some ways, you're coming at it fresh gives you a fresh perspective. Well, I'm com- coming at somebody who just travels around, and I don't stay in one state. I, you know, I've been to eight states on this trip, and I meet all different types of people. My experience is generally very similar. There's, there are differences. Obviously, going to a restaurant in New York is different from going to one in Dallas. But generally speaking, people th- are good people. They want the same thing. They yeah, want to they work want hard, things. be paid, and kind of be left alone. So, man, I think you're onto something, and I appreciate you coming on my little podcast as a of course, you know, huge fan of what you're doing, the community you're building. Uh, congratulations, man. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. It's a big deal. Presidential candidates and other presidents coming on a podcast I started as a fucking joke a few years ago. It's, uh, it's surreal, but um, I love what you're doing, man. And I wish you the best. Conscious of your time, how do people find out more about what you're doing? If they want to support the Forward Party, how do they do that? You go to forwardparty.com. You can go to andrewyang.com. I I have various uh, events up at all times. Uh, The lobbying organizations, uh, humanityforward.com. Any of those uh, are are great. But please, yeah, let's do it. Enough is enough, and the future needs us to be better than this. All right. Let's go. Come on, Yang gang. Let's go. Let's do it. Thank you, Peter. All right, man. Cool. Chill. Good luck.